Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Tonight, I will be presenting a story that has it all. Humor, pathos, friendship, loyalty, deception, and mystery, with a good bit of darkness thrown in for good measure. It's quite a ride. So, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, together, together. Now, before you bite my head off, yes, I know, I've posted this story before. My reason for reposting? I have a massive update to add. This morning, I was going through a really old hard drive, and on it, I discovered a folder titled Kearney. Here was found long-forgotten photographic proof to validate parts of my story. So by sharing this, Maybe some people will stop accusing me of having made it all up. These photos will be shared at the end of the video. Let me just say in advance, this is a long post, but every detail is relevant. And although everything that I have documented is factual, the case has never been solved and has likely gone cold. So, back in 2007, I was working as a bartender at a now-closed pub in my hometown in South Africa. Not a job I particularly liked, but it paid the bills. At that time, they hired a new kitchen manager that we all simply knew as Kearney. Kearney was a pleasant enough man who mostly kept to himself, but he always stayed late to help the barmen with our closing duties, so we all liked him for that. New in town, Kearney had yet to find a place to live, and I had recently lost my roommate, so someone suggested that he ask me for a room. Now, he was considerably older than the tenants I usually took in, but having had a bad streak of luck with people my own age, I thought an older man with a nice steady job may be a move in the right direction. So I agreed. Kearney wasted no time and followed me home that very night. Only he wasn't alone. Enter Lawrence, the boyfriend of Kearney. Honestly, I hadn't even realized the guy was gay up to that point, but it was water off my back. Looking back now, though, what really should have set off warning bells was Lawrence's appearance. He looked like he had been sleeping on the streets, rather apropos, as I would later come to find. So, Kearney moved in, and Lawrence was there a lot, too. It was always easy to know when he was there, because his mobile ringtone sounded like the quacking of a duckling. Kearney had some habits that are rather noteworthy to the story. Two things in particular. Number one, he basically never closed his bedroom door. Ever. No matter what he was doing in there, it was always open. And two, although he was a very heavy smoker, he never once smoked inside of the house. So, Kearney had been living with me for about two weeks when I came down with an awful case of pink eye. Because it's highly contagious, I was given a leave of absence from my bartending job, and I decided to wait it out by visiting my sister for a few days. Apparently, I didn't mind infecting her. Sorry, sis. My sister had to come pick me up, since I didn't pass my driver's test until age 24. The day she was meant to arrive, my friend and co-worker, Ben, decided to come take a look at the bar that we had been building together in my home. While in there, something caught my eye. All of the liquor bottles were now completely empty. Now anyone who knew me back then knows we're not talking about a random bottle or two of brandy here and there, but full bottles of whiskey, gin, vodka, schnapps, liqueurs, the works. Basically, it was a fully stocked bar that could host a rather large party. There had to have been at least 20 to 30 
full bottles of liquor of various types. So I call Kearney in, and I ask if he knew anything about this. He said that he and Lawrence had been on a slight drinking binge. Those were the actual words he used. Slight drinking binge. Well, this made me both furious at the thousand dollars or so stock that they drank up, but also slightly impressed that they were both actually still alive. Regardless, I told him I would deal with it upon my return. So I went to my sister's for a few days, and on that Friday, I got a call from my local police department asking me if I knew a man named Conrad Schultz. Nope, never heard of him. Then they said that maybe I might know him as Kearney, and that I should probably get down to the police station, as they had just arrested his boyfriend trying to sell my camera equipment. So my sister rushes me down there to find all of my camera equipment on display at the police station. It was then that I was informed that Lawrence was actually a former Navy SEAL who was dishonorably discharged before turning to a life of crime and now had a rap sheet the length of the Bible. The kicker? Both he and Kearney were actually homeless men who had met at the Salvation Army. So Lawrence went to jail, and my sister dropped me off back at home more or less around the time that Kearney got there, too. Based on Kearney's account, he had turned Lawrence in himself because he couldn't allow Lawrence to take advantage of me like that. Although I appreciated the sacrifice, I still told Kearney that he had to go because he had been the overall cause of this by bringing Lawrence into the house in the first place and binge drinking with him. However, not wanting to leave the homeless man homeless, I gave him until the end of the month to make other arrangements. When I got home from work the next day, I found a now free Lawrence sitting on the sidewalk across from my house, just watching it. I confronted him and I asked why he was there. He tried to give me some half-assed apology before begging me for money. That's right, the man who had just stolen from me the day before now had the temerity to beg me for money. I sent him packing without a cent. So Monday comes around and we have a staff meeting at work. The reason for the meeting was to give us all a rather sizable list of inventory, liquor bottles that had gone missing from the storeroom. This left much of the staff suspecting one another. I, however, would not have to wait long to figure out who the real culprit was, as just a few days later, I opened up the garbage bin in my kitchen to see the missing bottles, all empty, staring back at me. I decided to sit on that information for the time being, although I did photograph it, just in case I needed it later, as evidence. I also called Ben to inform him of this new development. As this was quickly becoming a detective game, we decided to enter Kearney's bedroom to search for further evidence. We found nothing of great significance in there, with one exception. Two photographs of Lawrence, before he turned into the homeless version of Lex Luthor. Actually, there were quite a few things of Lawrence's still in there. But as Lawrence had spent a lot of time there prior to the theft incident, I really just thought it was normal. Now I should add that I had mentioned Lawrence's release to Kearney, and I told him if I even suspected that they were still seeing one another, I would throw him out of the house immediately. Only a few days would pass before this would come into play. On that particular night, I had been bartending and Kearney had been constantly stopping by my station to help himself to glasses of wine mixed with Coke, which he would then go outside and drink behind the restaurant. When we confronted him about this, he correctly pointed out that he was still the manager and we had no right to tell him what he could or couldn't do. But on his fourth trip to get more wine and Coke, however, I had grown suspicious 
and I decided to follow him outside, where I discovered Lawrence sitting and sharing the wine and coke with Kearney. Well, this pissed me off. So the next day, I brought in my photographic evidence that Kearney was in fact the liquor thief and I handed it over to the general manager. While I didn't physically witness this, I did hear the confrontation through the office door when he fired Kearney. Kearney left, obviously upset, but apparently he had no idea that I was the one who turned him in. We closed early that night, and as I was walking home, I saw Kearney coming from the opposite direction. As he walked past me, he said only two words. I'm scared. Then he disappeared into the darkness. That would be the last time that I would ever physically lay my eyes on Conrad Schultz. So the final week before Kearney's eviction arrived, Ben came to stay with me for the duration as we both wanted to monitor the situation and make sure nothing else happened. It was during this week that Kearney's behavior suddenly changed. Before, he never smoked in the house, and his bedroom door was always open. Now, however, he was constantly smoking in his room, and the door was closed 24-7. In fact, neither Ben nor I had caught so much as a glimpse of him that entire week, but we hadn't thought much of it at the time. So the day of Kearney's eviction rolls around and Ben had gone home for a few hours and I finally heard Kearney's bedroom door open, someone walk out, open the front door, and leave. I went outside to say goodbye, but somehow he had already completely disappeared. But I discovered that he had left his house keys, indicating to me that he obviously wasn't planning on coming back. I took a look at the keys and noticed something strange. Although the correct keys were all there on the chain, there were also several that weren't mine. Why would he leave me these random keys, I remember thinking to myself as I walked into his room. Upon entering his room, I was in shock, not because of the state it was in, the two of them had broken the bed frame in an act of wild monkey sex, but I had known about that already. As I said, he never closed the door. No, what shocked me was that he had literally left almost all of his belongings behind, with one exception, the two photos of Lawrence. Upon further investigation, I realized that all traces of Lawrence ever having been there had completely vanished, but all of Kearney's stuff was left behind. Well, there was one thing that Lawrence left behind, his duckling ringtone, which turned out wasn't a ringtone after all, but an actual duckling, which was now casually strolling around the vacant bedroom. We named him Neville. So Ben returned and I updated him on this new development. Both of us thought that the way he left was rather weird. Of course, the whole thing had been rather weird. It was only when we asked ourselves that infamous question, did we ever actually see Kearney this past week, that it all became a conspiracy theory. We were shocked to realize that neither of us had actually laid eyes on him. We were suddenly putting pieces of the puzzle together. The changing habits, Neville the duck, the wrong keys, Lawrence's stuff being gone, but all of Kearney's stuff remaining. It was with great discomfort that we both asked the question, exactly who had been living with us in this house for the past week. Over the next few days, Ben and I went on a mission, searching the town, looking in landfills, crawling into drain pipes, trying to find any trace of Kearney's whereabouts. But they all added up to nothing. Conrad Schultz had simply vanished 
off the face of the earth. That wasn't the case for Lawrence, though. Oh, no. He was still around, having made some new homeless friends. We encountered him several times on the streets, begging for money. I asked him every time I saw him, Where's Kearney, Lawrence? But he acted like he had never even heard of him. The final time I would ever see Lawrence was across the street from where I worked, attempting to break into a car. I called the police on him, and they arrived rather quickly, arresting him on the spot. While he was being led away by the police, I shouted after him one last time. Where is Kearney, Lawrence? But he just ignored me as the cops dragged him away. The next day, I filed a missing persons report for Kearney, suggesting that Lawrence may well know something about his disappearance, but nothing ever came of it. So Lawrence, I don't know if you did something to Kearney or not, but if you did, let's not ever meet again. Now, as promised, here are the photos that I found on my old hard drive. I apologize for the awful quality of the pictures, but they were taken back in 2007 with my video camera's stills feature. The pictures. The liquor bottles. This is just part of the slight drinking binge that Kearney and Lawrence went on. The mattress. Here is the infamous mattress where Kearney and Lawrence had their hot monkey sex. Hosing Down the Mattress This has been Hosing Down the Infamous Mattress where Kearney and Lawrence had their hot monkey sex. Kearney's Closet Here are some of the things that were left behind. And then cleaning up the things that were left behind. The fake references. Here are the fake references that Kearney used to get the manager's job at the bar. Photos of Lawrence. And here are the photos of Lawrence. The car break-in and arrest. This is Lawrence breaking into the car across the street from where I worked. And this is Lawrence getting arrested for breaking into the car across the street from where I worked. The possible burial places. This is the landfill where Ben and I searched for Kearney's body. This is the entrance to the sewage drain pipe where we searched for his body. And finally, this is Neville the Duckling. Unfortunately, Neville didn't make it. I had him for quite a while, but he had been so malnourished for so long that it affected his growth. So even after several months, he still hadn't grown a single inch. One day, he just passed away very suddenly. I was shattered. Well, kids, did I lie? Wasn't this story everything that I promised? I briefly considered adding another story to this week's video. But really, how can you follow a story like this? Let me know in the comments section below what you think happened to Kearney. Did he just move on to parts unknown? Or did he meet with foul play? The only way this story could get any better is if one of you should happen to hold the key to this entire mystery. So if by some strange coincidence, any of you have information that could lead to the whereabouts of Mr. Conrad Kearney Schultz, contact me and I'll record an update. But for now, until next time, stay scared, my friends, and rest in peace, Neville.